Uh, we are, as you expect, delighted to welcome as our guest today uh, one of the giants of modern journalism, um, Lionel Barber. Lionel, as you'll know, was editor of the Financial Times for 15 years, indeed until January this year, uh, when he did that very rare thing for an editor these days of leaving under his own volition. Uh, I think after taking over as editor in 2005 and probably inheriting a paper that many felt had rather lost its way or certainly was in danger of, of doing so, Lionel set about transforming the AFT from a, a newspaper into a multi-channel global news organisation. And he did that very successfully. I, I know from my years at The Telegraph, which covered much of the same era, um, how difficult that challenge was. It was a real wild west full of trial and error and dead ends and daft ideas. And I think it's fair to say that the FT led the way uh, with its subscription-based model it very intelligently used the additional opportunities that digital presents to journalism, like this, for example. Um, and, and, but also on the old fashioned bits of hackery as well and scoop getting and its stable of world class writers, uh, its influence on the, the powerful. And I'm sure we'll all agree it did a tremendous job around the 2008 financial crisis, not just explaining to the rest of us what the hell credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations were, uh, though I suspect, like me, you've long since forgotten. Uh, during his editorship, the FT passed the milestone of a million paying readers, which is extraordinary. Um, Lionel in the paper also won a bundle of international awards and accolades. And uh, uh, apropos of today, uh, I know too that Scotland has a, pe a special place in Lionel's heart. Having begun his career in 1978 as a cub reporter at the Scotsman, uh, when he managed to uh, win the Young Journalist of the Year Award at the British Press Awards, I should warn you that Lionel also does what he believes to be an impressive Scottish accent, <laughs> though uh, some may beg to differ, <laughs> but we'll come back to that perhaps. <laughs> um, Lionel's been a good friend to Reform Scotland and, and we're here today to talk about his newly published memoir, The Powerful and the Damned, Private Diaries and Turbulent Times. It's, um, I've just finished it a week ago. It's, it's a fascinating, engrossing read. Uh, obviously, Lionel had a, a ringside seat throughout all of the major events, global events and domestic events of the past 15 years at least, uh, the tech boom, the financial crisis, Trump, the rise of China, Brexit, and for my own and his profession, the mainstream media's fight for survival in this age of fake news and wildly varied uh, outlets and, and sources of information. The diaries themselves are a bit of a who's who of global power, uh, meetings with both good guys and, and bad, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Angela Merkel, Mohammed bin Salman, David Cameron, Lloyd Blankfein, Dick Fuld, Boo Hiss, among many others. Uh, and it's a captivating insider's insight into uh, power and, and those who, who wield it. As Lionel himself writes, I was an interlocutor to dozens of people in power around the world, each offering unique insights into high-level decision-making and political calculation. These men of power, and they are almost all men rather than women, if not in Scotland, are accustomed to wrapping themselves in protective bubbles. Thanks to my position and the prestige of the FT, I was able to puncture the bubble and engage up close and personal with the powerful and the occasionally damned. Um, I'll just say that if you would like to buy a signed copy of Lionel's book, and I do very much recommend you buy a copy, uh, our partner Topping & Co in Edinburgh uh, have signed copies and there's a link to their website on your invitation. So please, please do that. Um, so welcome Lionel. I'll just say, first of all, thanks for coming. Chris, um, thank you very much for extending the invitation and uh, thank you all for, for joining this virtual conversation interview. Um, I want to say two things. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to start my career in Scotland, well away from uh, England University with some great journalists. I think you know who they were, are. And, and second, I just want to say um, that Reform Scotland is an important part of the exchange of ideas and sensible discourse on economics and politics. And every serious city and political capital needs a think tank and a serious think tank. And I think you got that with Reform Scotland. Oh, thank you very much for that. I completely agree. Um, first, I'd just like to start by asking you a very basic question about how it feels to no longer be editing the FT. FT. I mean, 15 years is, is some shift. Do you still wake up with layouts and splash headlines in your head? Do you get twitchy around deadline time? Because the book certainly makes clear you still have huge enthusiasm for it and belief in journalism. 
The uh, unadulterated feeling which I wake up most mornings is relief <laughs> because the idea of editing the Financial Times in the age of COVID, where the newsroom no longer exists, there's none of the banter, none of the exchange, everything is being done remotely. Uh, and secondly, you can't travel. Most people are, are not getting out of the office. All that means it's incredibly difficult to, to do. And I suppose the last point is if you know, as I did and planned to leave at a certain date, there's a caesura, there's a, there's a time, it's the right time to go, turn 65, it's over. So it is over and I don't have that nagging, you know, I want to check on what's on page five, bottom, of the, is it right, whatever. It's frankly a relief. And that's even before we talk about managing journalists, which is a whole new, <laughs> an a whole comment. different exercise. <laughs> One of the things that, that really stuck out to me reading the book uh, was was not the content, but but something beyond that, which was how you approached these this almost relentless schedule of meetings with the the, the great and the good, what you call your proconsular trips uh, abroad. I, I, and I think as a hack, you do find yourself in almost unimaginable situations at times. You you more than than most, and through it all, you seem. I can't really think of a better word than unimpressed. Uh, is, it, is, it, is that just the pragmatism and phlegmatic nature of a, a hack? And you do describe yourself as a reporter at, at heart. And I recognise bits of myself in that. Or, or is it because you were there as editor of the FT and had the status of that office? Or is it just your personality that you were unimpressed regardless of who you were sitting in front of you? Yeah, well, I will deal with the was I impressed or not? Because occasionally I was quite impressed. Um, I'll deal with that in just a minute. I just want to address the, the heart of the question, which is the editor-reporter role. I mean, can you do it? If you're the editor of the FT, shouldn't you be in the office, working with people, checking on headlines, and basically being there, present, omnipresent? Why did you spend so much time overseas? Were you, I mean, my self-ironic description, the non-dom editor at times? Um, and I think it's important to understand that the FT is a global publication. And it, I wanted to put the standard, the pink flag, if you like, in places um, where we hadn't been before. And I wanted to convey the whole idea of, of we are a world news organization. And I also wanted to work with reporters on the ground. And I felt doing big interviews could help break stories. And by the way, we have a hundred foreign correspondents. So it was pretty interesting seeing who was cutting the mustard and who wasn't. So uh, I also felt that I didn't do any trips at all for a year. And then I said, right, now I'm gonna do one trip. And then I thought actually every year, and I'm making a bit of a joke about pro-consular. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, the editor going up obviously does shake things up. But I felt this was a sort of way of decompressing. I mean, I worked damn hard, but, but just learning, it was an educational thing as much as anything else. Now, was I impressed or not? Look, the most important thing when you're doing these rep reporting, and I didn't just go to the salons, I also went to the slums from Mumbai to uh, the favelas in Brazil to Kibera and whatever. I felt it was, you've always got to have that little bit of distance. So I'm trying to convey not breathlessness, but a studied observation of power in the book. And we can go through the various characters, but I think you're probably a little too hard when you say I was completely unimpressed by most people. I mean, some people I was really unimpressed by, and we could talk about who they were. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, and we will. I, I, I have no doubt about it. I have the names written down. The, um, when you took over the FT, obviously the big part of the book is the transformation of the FT uh, over your, your period of, of editorship. Um, so what was your analysis of, of how and why the FT had to, had to change? And, and like many news, I mean, all newspapers have had to do it. And these institutions are usually old, often very conservative and, and slow moving. So I'm interested in how you 
approach to what was quite radical change and, and brought people with you. You talked about you know managing journalists, and we, we both know that hacks are not always the most accommodating or easygoing of, of people. So what was it you changed? Why did you change it? And how did you go about taking everyone with you? Yeah, Chris, I mean, that's a great question, which an editor would ask. And I, it's important to understand the context. I mean, I was not appointed the editor of the FT when I applied when I was 46. I lost out and they appointed a, a man called Andrew Gowers and he took over in 1999. And after several years, and I, I went very shortly thereafter, sorry, he, he was appointed in 2002, I'm sorry. Um, 2001, um, see, it's, that's what happens with age and no longer at the helm. <laughs> he was appointed in 2001 and the, the commercial organization didn't respond to the dot-com boom and then the crash. So we lost a ton of money, 60 million pounds in three years. And Andrew just, he wasn't really good enough. I mean, that, that's the fact. And I was watching this in New York and just doing my job. And I suddenly, it was obvious that something was gonna happen. And I was then told, okay, you've got to sort this out. You've got the job. So I was 50. And that's important because when you're 50, you've seen a lot more, you've had management experience, you've done a lot of reporting. So I came with a fair amount of credentials, knowing I had a mandate for change. And frankly, I couldn't do any worse than what we just seen. And I, secondly, I took advice. I spoke to some three or four individuals in America about what are the key things you should do as a manager when you take over and you know you've got to make difficult changes. And I described that in the book. And it is worth dwelling on because, you know, Stan O'Neill gave me that great piece of advice. I'm sitting there and I say, you've cut, Stan O'Neill of Merrill Lynch, I said, you've cut $4.5 billion. I've got to cut a few million. What do you do? And he said, don't piss about with the small stuff. This is what he said. You've only change, achieved real change through, say, through structural change, real savings. So, and then he said, and I'm writing all this down, then he says, and also get yourself an enforcer, somebody to you know, be a lightning rod. So I'm writing this down. And then in this dry Alabama accent, he says, and there's one other thing, Lionel, he says, the enforcer may not survive the process. And so I, th I thought about that. Howard Stringer taught me about communication. You, with journalists, you've got to continue. You think you've made the message, but you haven't unless you constantly repeat it and you have to think about strong slogans. And then look, I don't want to take all the credit for the commercial turnaround. I did say to them, you've got to raise prices. And second, our business model is broken. This was the unsaid. We were trying to live off advertising. So the answer to your question is we had to reinvent the business model, charge for content, and we had to raise prices, and then we needed to sell direct to the customer. And that's what we did. And then the newsroom itself, which I did, had to change to being really digital in the journalistic form. And that was an iterative process. So those are many of the things. Um, just to sum up, the most important thing, I'd liken this, and I am a bit dramatic, but that's the way I am. I said, look, we just need to send a sense of direction. We don't know whether it's absolutely the right one. I, you know, but Napoleon had a sense of direction. He just went the wrong way at the end, <laughs> eastwards to Moscow. But when an army's going through snow, they need to have a leader and a sense of direction, and it is going to get better. And I think I managed to convey that. Mm. And on top of that, it wasn't just the structure of, of newspapers that, that had to change. The climate into which they were writing was changing as well, obviously. Yes. You know, what's happening to news, so many channels, so many outlets, the role played by Facebook and Twitter yes. and the rest, fake news. Um, what, what do you see as being the role of the newspaper or... A mainstream media organization today are there lines they shouldn't cross but how should they be different from the pre-digital 
era, I sometimes think, you know, looking at your, your book, you had you know, the great Ben Bradley, the Washington Post editor, as a, as a mentor. Where would their equivalents come from in, in the future, Those idea, the idea of an editor as an intellectual and, and moral force, when you're just one voice in this miasma of uh, opinion and, and uh, fact and fake news? Yeah, it's, it's a very big question. Um, so let me start with the positive. Um, and that is, many people thought in this, what I would describe as the age of fragmentation in media, because, you know, in the old days, you had maybe two, three print newspapers in a city. Um, they had a lock on the classified advertising and they had display advertising. They made good margins and they were also the gatekeepers. They were the place where you went for the news. They printed the news, all the news that was fit to print. That's where it comes from. And in the new age of fragmentation, where you have these other um, huge aggregators of information and basically near digital advertising monopolies and disintermediating you, what do you do? And for me, the answer was one brand. The one thing the FT had was a brand. You can call it pink, but for me, I wanted to make it bigger than that. And it was going to be the world business journalism brand. So what did I need to do to strengthen that brand? I honestly thought that pricing was a good way to establish value, um, both internally to tell the journalist, you're going to have to step up your game, but also externally. People moaned about paying more, but frankly, we were worth it. And it was sending a signal. Second, you and this plays directly to your point, Chris, about intellectual. I mean, I, I, I think it was or, or thought it was absolutely critical to have great writers and thinkers in the FT. And I had colleagues who also had networks. So we really I made big I made a big thing about building up people like Gillian Tett on markets, financial crisis, um, Martin Wolf and then getting right, great writers to write for Weekend. And, you know, Alec Russell, the current editor, has done that. Now, on the negative side, what do you do? The one thing you don't want, one thing you, you, you've got to be really careful about is that your own journalists don't join the fragmentation um, game. And what I mean by that is that they don't defect because they've got some startup that looks really good, but it's making no money, but is basically getting a check from Facebook, but they think they're gonna join something exciting and new, and you lose one of your best people. Um, so re re not just recruiting, but retaining talent was absolutely important in the age of fragmentation. And second, you've got to make sure that your own journalists don't start misbehaving and damaging your brand. And what I mean by that, is what Tim Davey rightly has attacked at the BBC, which is everybody going on Twitter and mouthing off and saying things that, frankly, oh, these, these, these views are only my own. Well, they're not because you're employed by the FT. So what you do matters on what you say. So I could go more into that, but I think let's just coalesce the argument and the answer around brand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. I have many similar uh, points made in that. Um, I'd, I'd like to, I could talk to you about this all day, but I'd like to move on to, to some of the individuals and the, the issues that, that you um, were covering as a, a journalist then. And we should probably start with the States um, and with Donald Trump, I guess. Uh, you worked in the US for many years and you've been back many times, clearly. Um, maybe you want to just tell us a bit about your personal experiences with Trump. Well, I only had one, but uh, you're right. I mean, I'd, I'd spent, uh, I ended up working in America for 10 years, six in Washington, if you include also the time at the Washington Post, and then nearly four years in America, in New York. And I traveled around the country, being in 47 states, knew the country well. So that was a great um, background. And I'm fascinated by politics and foreign policy. That's what I wrote about, and national security, particularly. And I've interviewed five presidents. Um, and the last one was Trump in a completely different category to everybody else. And the way I describe it going into that, de that day in the end of March, 2017, was 
it was like going into a, well, I'm not that I was around at the time, but what Angus would describe as, you know, a medieval court. I mean, there is the king. He's behind the resolute desk and he is behaving like a king, not like a president, but he's got these courtiers cooing and bowing and scraping. And then he, to change the metaphor, he's looking around the Oval Office. Have you been here? Have you been here before? This is the sort of the Oval Office suite. It's part of the hotel um, here that I'm in. And then he looked at me and I thought, well, I want to say something that kind of at least try, you always try and set the tone at the beginning of the conversation. And so I said, thank you um, very much for seeing us, Mr. President. And thank you for subscribing to the FT because I knew he, he had FTs on his desk. And he looked at me and just in the tone of Tony Soprano said, that's okay, you lost, I won. And so, you know, right, you're the globalization brigade, but he still wanted to talk to us. Yes. And, and I, I would say there was a mixture of astonishing levels of narcissism um, and a kind of studied thuggishness. No grace whatsoever compared to Bush senior or indeed junior that I interviewed or, or Obama or certainly Clinton who wanted to schmooze anybody. So he was unique, slightly disturbing. And I came away just having a sense of somebody who could do a lot of damage, but also somebody who maybe, and I think I was wrong about this, I felt based on other conversations in, in the White House and in the administration that maybe there was a little bit more rationality mm. or a little bit more sensible than, than first thought. And I was wrong about that. Mm. And, and uh, I think beyond the man himself, as you, as you pointed out, the, the, there was a whole world out there that, that was uh, being dealt with by him and responding to, to that narcissism and, and that very strange transactional way of, of doing business. And I, I watched a Chatham House event yesterday with Tony Blinken, who is, I think, a hugely impressive uh, man mm. who is likely to be Biden's mm. chief of staff. And, and Now, Blinken's going to be Secretary of State. Sorry, sorry Secretary of State was what I meant. Um, yeah. And... and uh, you know, from what he was saying then, I think it was back in March, it was recorded, but it was, it was, you know, it was really music to, to the ears, I think, certainly of people that they would call liberals, um, suggesting we'll move back to a situation where the US would resume its mantle of, of global leadership, but, but working with its allies to, to do so, especially if in dealing with Russia and, and China. I just wondered when watching that, how much of what Trump did do you think might prove to be irreversible as, as Blinken said then you know we're not going to go back to the way things were before completely something no, that's important changed. to know that and yeah. what, what, what lingers from the America first approach the you know the, the hatred of globalization that transactional bilateral deal making that that, that that Trump brought so what what can we justifiably expect as people who are living in the American world if you like that uh, we can get well that? first of all I think it's wrong and a bit dangerous to talk about a restoration because as Tony Blinken recognizes, you can't go back to say eight years ago, maybe it wouldn't even be wise to go back. Um, there will be some changes which are important and encouraging. And we have to note in passing that four more years of Trump would have done tremendous damage to America's standing and to its alliance uh, alliances and friendships around the world. Mm -hmm. I would recommend, he's a friend of mine, Bob Zulick's History of American Diplomacy and Foreign Policy is brilliant at picking up this, um, how important working with allies has been throughout, from the earliest days of the Republic. Now, there are, there, so there will be some changes, they'll rejoin the uh, WHO, um, they will not run down NATO further. And um, I think, I don't think they'll join no TPP in Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, the WTO is something also to look at, uh, the, the World Trade Organization, I, I, where Trump has undermined essentially the arbitration system. Um, and where the warming, crucial thing for me is the China relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that we can go back. That's where Trump 
One is in tune with public opinion, but also corralled the business establishment behind him around the notion that China is the big competitor, they're cheating, they're stealing our intellectual property, they're a national security threat in that respect. We need, we, we need to stand up to China. I think Biden will cooperate. He will seek areas of agreement. I think the obvious one is on climate change ahead of this important um, climate change summit next year, chaired by the British. Um, but I think on other aspects, he's got a Democratic Party, which is even more protectionist than the Republicans. He will be quite tough on China, but it won't be all out confrontation across the board. And he will work with allies in a more effective way than Trump did on China. I'll just I'll come back to China in a second. But I just um, one of the things, again, that Blinken was talking about was Iran. And I know that's something that you yes. spent quite a bit of time on. In fact, when you met Hassan Rouhani, the president who spent part of his education at Glasgow Caledonia University, you say that you take a diplomatic gamble and whisper in his ear in a heavy Scottish accent, I bring special greetings from Glasgow. Now, I bring special greetings from Scotland. From Scotland, was it? From Scotland. I mean, the Lord whole knows what country, you... Chris, not just Glasgow. <laughs> All those Glaswegians, I'm sorry about that. That's a matter of debate. And I know I got, I got done over on my fake Scottish accent, but it's not that good, but it's near bad. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Blinken was talking a bit about going, you know, going back to the Iranian situation, which is one of the many things yeah. that, that Trump unpicked. Um, and so we're thinking then about a return to the, the nuclear deal, uh, a return to some degree of, of cooperation. But you spent time in Iran. You've met a lot of the, the major uh, players over there. What, what, what's your reading of the situation there uh, in, in terms of going back to the table and what they'll be up for? Well, it's very important to, to understand that the overwhelming amount, number of sanctions and pressure that, they, that the Trump administration has put on Iran has essentially um, undermined Rouhani, who is, he's not a moderate, he's a pragmatist. The economy is in, in terrible shape. So we've really got to look to see who will be the next Iranian president. Um, will it be someone who is a moderate, was sort of, in similar mold, or will it be one of the, the radicals? And also to just remember, the theocracy is the theocracy. I mean, that's not gonna change. The Iran deal itself, the nuclear deal was flawed because it was a deal without context. It didn't address Iranian belligerence and fostering trouble throughout the region. Mm. The second very, very important point here, and this answers directly your question about what endures. Right at the end of the Trump administration, you saw an important deal between the Israelis and the UAE on normalization of relations. We also know that Bibi Netanyahu was in Saudi Arabia at the weekend. There is a rapprochement in the works there. This is the new reality in the Middle East. And without and just mentioning my book, there's a very important segment where I do go out and it was a big call on whether to do it after Lehman crashed to visit the region with the now editor Rula Khalaf. And we went to the Israeli defense ministry and there's a fascinating passage where essentially this official with the photograph of Auschwitz in the, on his desk basically says the Palestinians, they're just a secondary issue now. Al Qaeda is a secondary issue. It's all about our struggle with radical Islam and stability is more important than democracy. That was an incredible mm. statement given $2 trillion spent by the Americans trying to bring democracy to Iraq and the rest of the region. The Israelis have called this right in effect, pre-Arab spring, and they are setting the terms of the debate and the terms of relationships in the region with that deal with the UAE? Mm. Uh, as you kind of touched on there. Long I mean, answer, sorry. No, 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 it's fascinating. And, and Blinken made the point that sometimes a nuclear treaty is just a nuclear treaty. It's not something that's going to end all of the problems we have with Iran. It was just 
stop them doing one thing. Um, but unfortunately, um, the way Trump's behaved, you know, they have gone back to full scale disruption throughout the, the region again. Um, and so stability is a funny word to use in a sense when what they're trying to do is destabilize uh, and, and um, I suppose uh, build a client base around the, around the region. Um, is, is it likely that, that under Biden that the Iranians could be made to behave a bit better in areas that are not nuclear, if you see what I mean, other diplomatic areas? Well, I think, again, that's where the people more skilled than I will be looking at how much do you fall in with MBS or do you create a bit of distance with MBS in order to play a bit of footsie with the, um, with, with the Iranians? Uh, just, and you've also got to use some carrots. So it's carrot and sticks as well. I mean, then they, I would be amazed. And Biden not, may not be able to do it anyway because of uh, Congress di dictates on yeah. sanctions. So those won't be able to be lifted at, at, at all um, anytime soon. So it is going to be quite difficult to revive that deal, given what Trump has done. Also, the Americans can use the Europeans as interlocutors yeah. with the Iranians. In the end, it's going to come down to um, what, is, what Iran thinks it's in, is in its best interests, and maybe curb some of the behavior. But remember, that's the other story which is not written about enough. The withdrawal of the Americans from this region is letting all sort, uncorking all sorts of other bad behavior, notably from the Turks. Mm -hmm. And the UAE, is, the UAE and Turkey is involved in Libya, for goodness sake. This is the new world. Always something new to worry about. Yeah, I think um, just since you mentioned him, another fascinating individual that you met was MBS Mohammed bin Salman, mm -hmm. who I'm sure to everyone just seems like an extraordinary figure, almost sort of mythical, something out of a, a fable or, or, or whatever. What's, what's he like? Is he physically looks like a very big and intimidating presence when you see him even beside his bodyguards? What, what did you make of him? Well, the first time I met him was in November 2015 and Rula. Khalaf was with me and you know the, we went into this right underground um, in this in the room with two elderly translators and this man swept in I mean he is huge by the way he's he's got a massive domed forehead and um, he at that time I did not put this in the book and I probably should be careful about this but he did have a sort of um, a slight movement of his head and nobody knows quite what it was, whether it was a nervous tick or whatever, but it's gone now. And that was quite dis disconcerting. He wanted to impress um, desperately, and he wanted to give us the impression that he was the kind of um, the, the, the regent in, in, in the kind of one in waiting. At that time, he wasn't the crown prince, he was the deputy crown prince, but he was already accumulating power. I think. Uh, you saw the slight thuggishness as well, the irritation, um, but he showed a, a one or two bits of um, humor. So, for, for example, when he was dropping names like crazy, saying that Putin had invited him to come to Moscow several times and it had even invited him to go skiing, I said, well, Your Highness, I think you should wear a helmet if you're going skiing with Vladimir Putin, which I thought was terribly funny, but there we are. Um, anyway, he then, of course, um, did oust the crown prince. He became the king in waiting. And the next time I saw him was at a private dinner at now Lord Lebedev's um, house or mansion in Hampton Court. And this again, people have said, why are you going to have lunch or dinner? with MBS, isn't he a terrible person? And what about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who we had had lunch with in 15? The answer is that that dinner took place before the killing. If he had been killed, um, I might not have accepted the dinner invitation. The fact is it was worth it. It was worth watching him and his obsession with Iran and his talk about modernizing Saudi Arabia which of course is the work of two generations. Mm, well, that's the journalist's job is to be there, isn't it? To pay, to pay well, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, you take some heat, but, but this is not, I mean, really, if you're not prepared 
to be, if you like, the man or the woman in the arena, mm. to quote from Teddy Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents, you're not going to get anywhere. And your job is, you know, would I have, would, would you, Chris, have accepted an invitation um, sent um, from Berlin to Edinburgh in 1938 to interview Hitler? Of course. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. What, what, um, on the policy side, how, how steady do you think those Arab states are, like Saudi, given the, the changes we're seeing to energy production and, and consumption, and obviously the, the, they're quite authoritarian, totalitarian in, in the way that they run their own countries. What, is that is that going to be a tr problem for them in the years ahead? Well, of course, it's 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 a huge problem when you have a country which is essentially ossified in the way that Saudi Arabia has been for decades, you also take on, and he has, I'm not carrying water in the desert for MBS, but the fact is he's taken on the Wahhabi clerical establishment. He has done a degree of liberalization on women driving, um, women being allowed to live at home without under the, he's also on the labor market, the Khalaf, I think it's called system. Um, so he's loosening this country up, it's tremendously, um, dangerous and difficult. He's also, though, got the youth on his side. I mean, they like having uh, heavyweight boxing matches or pop concerts in public compared to what they had. And there's a degree of sort of Saudi nationalism. Now, the danger, it seems to me, comes from more the, the, the extended royal family. So far, he's intimidated the business establishment. He's shaken them down literally for hundreds of several hundred million or several billion billion dollars um, because of the fraud he got them he locked them all up which um reminds me of one joke which i do put in the book which is a true story when i was asked to speak to a dinner in london full of saudis and asked about mbs and the reform program and i said well there have been reports of, of torture but and then this gentleman who's a very senior Saudi business and said, oh, excuse me, um, I would just like to reject any notion that there has been torture in Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman, unless, and then he pauses, unless you count as the owner of the Four Seasons being locked up in the Ritz Carlton for seven weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just um, that. Uh, I'm sure. that one, they do have a sense of humor yes yes of a type yeah <laughs> the uh, mo moving from one authoritarian state to another uh, go back to china um it still seems i suppose a bit unclear as to whether they are planning to play by international rules and, and, and norms or only when it suits them which has maybe been more of the evidence that we've seen and uh, i suppose a recent example of that would be the refusal to allow international scientists and inspectors into the wet food markets in Wuhan, where COVID uh, seems to have, have begun. Um, again, a country where you've, uh, spent, you've certainly given a lot of attention to it. You spent quite a bit of time, certainly with the, the people and the, the, the diplomats in this country. Um, what, what's your sense about where China's going, what they'll be thinking about Biden coming in, the, uh, the sense of taking responsibility that goes with being one of the two great global powers, um, are they, are, can, can we expect them to sort of tuck in and do the bit or a way in for a rough time? Well, first of all, I'm sure there are people in this group who know China even better than I do. I mean, I probably made 10 trips when I was editor. In fact, they used to keep a note of this and say, oh, as a friend of China who's been China you know, eight times or nine, <laughs> whatever, they've got records and everything. The, the, I'll make a few obvious points. The first is that they operate on a different time scale to us. I mean, we think about tomorrow, next month, maybe next year. And they, the Chinese are thinking in decade or 20 years, or even as Xi Jinping has pointed out, um, you know, 2035. That's what he's thinking, the plan, where we want to be in 2035. And they even done on carbon zero by 2060. So, this is really important to think about how they approach policy and how they uh, don't, they're not blown around tactically. This is even, this is accentuated by Xi, 
who has clearly broken the principle of two terms only. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at three, maybe four, whatever. And he's a different type of leader. He has a very clear view that his, his part of his um, historical legacy will be to establish China as sovereign in its region and as the second superpower, not the superpower in waiting, but the second superpower. And that applies to national security, military, et cetera, but also, for example, on the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. which is a truly global. I mean, this is quasi colonization. It's like the British Empire um, 150 years ago, in some ways, establishing those trading routes, infrastructure, people on the ground. It's, it's really important. And they're also acting increasingly as a global player. We don't hear or write enough about this, but what they're up to in the Balkans, how they're squeezing the Italians, or the weaker points in Europe, how they're trying to break up Europe. I mean, I have a scene where, this, where they're trying to prize Britain away from, from Europe and America. That's their strategy. So this is very, very important. They have a sense of historical mission. Now, how will they behave? I think they're caution. They're more cautious than we think they are, but it is worrying nevertheless what, when you see these nationalist voices, for example, about Taiwan. They want Taiwan back in one China, not one China, two systems. So any res lack of resolve there or change in course, that, that they will take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's what, what we must hope for in conclusion is that this administration is a bit more consistent, working with allies, finding areas of cooperation with China, and the Chinese will respond, but being wide-eyed about Chinese weight and they attach the importance that they attach to their, own, their country's own historical development and place in the world. You talk about Taiwan, Hong Kong would be the other <clears throat> issue. Well, of course, particular relevance that, that, to yeah, Britain. That, that's incredibly important. And essentially, um, they have, they're just squeezing until the pips squeak. And they, they have the new national security law is clearly a violation of the um, joint agreement of 94. And they are essentially just treating it. It's part of the mainland now. Mm. That, that's the way it's going to be. It's never going to be the same. It certainly can't go back. And and how would you how would you think China views post Brexit Britain? What should our posture be towards China between opportunity and, and and threat? We're obviously no longer part of the EU, which removes a huge amount of our uh, diplomatic weight or, or ability to to bargain. Um, so how do we approach a, 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 a well? I think we need China? to we we. we First of all, uh, I wouldn't exaggerate the degree of manoeuvre room here. I mean, the, the most important thing that happened in the last year was you saw the full force of American lobbying and pressure. So a government position which was nuanced on Huawei has become completely pro-American. We're now saying they are a national security mm -hmm. threat. We're going to impose swinging sanctions on any company that basically has anything to do with Huawei kit or has kit around. I mean, they're really strong fight. That was not the position, nor was it the position of the intelligence services a year ago. It was more nuanced. And we were trying to have a nuanced position with China. I think that Osborne's tilt in 2015, 13-15, uh, was naive. Um, frankly, um, he went kowtowing off to uh, Xinjiang when he knew there were human rights abuses, that's exactly what the Chinese wanted. And then he was probably a little too keen to just bring in the Chinese um, investment and exaggerating what the city of London could benefit from say RMB um, trading offshore. But it's, I don't think we should just be in completely in America's pocket. So we've got to find a way, and it's going to be harder because we're out of the European Union, um, to, to, to sort of get a balance right, but, it, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Okay. okay. Um, now, if, if you would like to, so we'll be in... joining. Maybe we'll be joining NAFTA. Okay. Um, and the, sort of, you know, 
Don't put it past. Anyone. Well, no. If, if if Boris gets his way, I'm I'm sure that would be uh, the, the the trick. Um, if people have questions, could you send them to me, please? I mean, I've got loads, and I can just keep going until the end. But it would be a shame. Uh, not to get some audience questions in here. So please just do send me a message. Uh, I can't see you, so there's no point wiggling your arm in there or anything. So you'd have to use the message dongle on, 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 on Zoom. I'll just ask one more question. Hopefully we'll get some audience questions in the meantime. Um, we talk a bit about uh, bankers. Um, and one of the most entertaining bits of the book is your, your meetings with some of these uh, titans as they became something less than titans around 2000 and eight Dick Fould and Lloyd Blankfein and, and, and others. Um, just quite interested in your take on, um, it's maybe not the biggest issue, but I'm fascinated by the kinds of people that become chief executives of these enormous banks uh, and whether that type of person has changed particularly since 2008, the Goodwins and the, the Foulds and the hard driving, um, you know, the aggressive, rude uh, and arrogant Type. Does it just have to be that way, or do you think there has been a, a shift towards you know the kind of person that has more of an understanding of you know arguably the 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 need to understand their place in society a bit more uh, uh, or that kind of thing? Or, or is that well, let, let let me um, and I will say something about Royal Bank, um, not least because um, Peter De Vink is in the audience and he's quite right to remind me that um, you know I made probably the biggest story I did when I was on the Scotsman and for several years was just write and be uh, about that great struggle, successful struggle to ensure that the Royal Bank remained independent and wasn't gobbled up either by Standard Chartered or by Lloyds Bank or indeed Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. And I think that was a worthy struggle. And I was just sorry to what happened afterwards, but we'll come to that. So I think, um, Look, Dick Fould was universally regarded as one of the best chief executives of, on Wall Street until 2007, eight. And the fact is, he just took too many risks. He couldn't take money off the table and he kept betting on American real estate and it, it went wrong. And so at that point, he became a very rather unpleasant um, and fairly intimidating character. But before that, he was very charming. Then you had Lloyd Blankfein, who I always thought was one of the smartest guys in town. I mean, very, very smart. And they did an amazing job of both of hedging their bets. And I write about this in the book um, and not going all in. They were on both sides of the, of the trade, if you like, on credit derivatives and, and on the real estate plays. And then Fred Goodwin, I mean, he turned up in 2006 with his team, Johnny Cameron. And I, I, I was just rather stunned. Somebody said to me, why didn't you, or in one of the reviews, they said, you know, what did you really think of Goodwin? I think it comes across in the book. I just thought he was very arrogant and, you know, full of himself. And it was just too much. And then I went a few months later to visit some old friends in Edinburgh and went to their new headquarters in Gogoburn. And I knew something was wrong. When I, when I walked through the door and there were literally dozens of screens of Fred talking as if he was, you know, something out of 1984 or maybe worse. I just thought it was the cult of personality. It was over the top. And, I, you know, there are always the giveaway at the lunch. And I should have put this in the book more clearly, but I remember somebody asking about his private plane and he went sort of semi nutso. And I thought, why is he so upset? This isn't quite right. Do you know what I mean? It's just yeah, that yeah. thing. Yeah. So has has that has the the cult of personality has that has that gone? Has it has it been no, reduced a bit? It, it's it, well, <laughs> the banks are first of all. Again, people know this in the audience. I mean, they have now almost as regulated as utilities. So the light touch regulation, which is when this book starts, that's over in the city, and banks bank returns have diminished the risk taking has diminished um, and the new players are not these giant investment banks they're the private equity for example the black or black rock asset management um, I do I think the other that some are obviously very powerful but they become very powerful because of the concentration of power and industry that happened after the financial crisis JP Morgan being 
One, I would say Jamie Dimon is a very impressive individual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's had one or two health issues. He's come through that. And he's he's just a master leader and manager of an enormously complicated bank. Yeah. Um, But someone like Anthony Jenkins, who I describe in the book at Barclays, St. Anthony, as he was known, Mm -hmm. championing ethical banking. I mean, you're not going to get very far with that. It doesn't last. No. 